it's a very special evening today, a very special event that we have here at our Bangalore DC. I'm Divya, and it is my pleasure to be your host this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we also have amongst us a very, very special and prominent guest, and it is our pleasure to have with us Thomas L. Friedman. We celebrate today Thomas Friedman, who's known to us as the author of the best-selling book, The World is Flat. Um, there's a lovely story behind this title, and I'm sure through the, today evening you'll get to know that insider story for those of us who don't know it. Um, he's not only, you know, he's a prolific author, journalist, columnist, and um, he's won not one, not two, not but three Pulitzer Prizes, um, six books, that's what he's written, and it's amazing how many readers, how many um, people that he's in inspired through his work. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, providing us <laughs> providing us insights on foreign affairs, international economics, and just so much more. We can't wait to listen to you speak to, you, speak to all of us about your latest book. Thank you for being late. I just loved that title, Thomas. <laughs> And you know, if you could tell us a little bit about the story behind that as well, that would be so amazing. Our relationship with Thomas Friedman goes back to the 2000s. And to talk about this accomplished guest of ours, uh, I'd like to invite on stage our co-founder and non-executive chairman of the board, Nandan Nilkeni. Oh, thank you, and it's really great to be here uh, welcoming my good friend Tom Friedman to Infosys. Uh, Tom has known Murthy and me for 15 years now and been a visitor here. And of course, we all know that the book, The World is Flat, was conceived in this building. And uh, I think uh, Tom's one of those exceptional in human beings. He's, he's, uh, he explains the world to everybody, the progress happening. He's able to go from technology to Middle Eastern politics to environment. And he's able to actually combine and connect all the dots and explain how the world is changing. So I think it's something phenomenal that uh, he's doing. And he's not an armchair columnist. He's not a guy sitting in Washington, smoking a pipe and pontificating about the world. He's a guy on the move. Whenever I get an email from him, I don't know where it's from, Dalian, you know, it's all, all, it could be from anywhere in the world. And he's a guy who's an inveterate uh, traveler. In fact, uh, he, he's, uh, he's also, you know, because of his deep knowledge of Middle Eastern politics uh, and his knowledge of Arabic, he's also become the principal interlocutor to the world on what's happening in that very complex region. And I'm sure you'll hear more from him uh, about that. And today is here because uh, we, his latest book, Thank You for Being Late, which really is the culmination of all the years of his noticing the trends that are happening in our world. And he'll talk to you about that. And for those who don't know, he's also a very good golfer. And uh, many of you are probably are trying to be golfers, but he shoots six handicap. And uh, when he was young, his father wanted him to be a professional golfer. But I guess he became a columnist instead. But, you know, he's, he's outstanding. And if you remember the book, The World is Flat, it begins by him playing at the KGA. So he's, he's made KGA globally famous uh, thanks to the book. So, Tom, without further ado, uh, if you could just talk, uh, I think your slides are there. And then we'll follow that up with uh, a set of questions. And I'm very grateful that Mr. Murthy is on the campus today and is being part of this function. Thank you, Murthy. Thank you very much. Great. And uh, oh, good, perfect. Thank you. Well, uh, Nandan, thank you so much. It's it's a treat to, to be here, and and the fact that Mr. Murthy is here too is a double uh, pleasure. And thank you all for coming out. I remember this room vividly because uh, on uh, a visit here in 2004, Nandan took me in this room. And he said they had these cameras and they could have like a simultaneous conversation with people all over the world, customers and clients. And in 2004, I was really wowed by that. You know, I thought that was really amazing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm, uh, I'm not and I actually met, I think it was in the late 90s at Davos. And um, uh, in, uh, um, uh, in, in the early uh, 2000s, I actually started doing documentaries for a new channel that the New York Times formed with Discovery. It was called Discovery Times Channel. And I did my first documentary on uh, the roots of 9-11. I did my second one on Israeli-Palestinian issues. I did 
um, uh, and that we were looking for the third, third one in, in 2004. And I um, wanted to do a documentary on why everybody hates America. Um, that's how this all started. And um, uh, this sort of post 9-11, and uh, um, I started to, how should we do that? And I had this idea that what we should do is go to call centers all over the world and interview young people who spend their days imitating Americans um, on what they thought of America, you know, sort of uh, Zhao by day, John by night, you know, whatever. I thought it'd be an interesting double mirror. And um, so we we're actually budgeting that out when um, in the middle of the presidential campaign, John Kerry came out with his blast against Benedict Arnold's CEOs who engage in outsourcing. And so I just said to the, the Discovery Channel people, you know what, why don't we just do a documentary, we'll call it the other side of outsourcing. And let's actually go to a place, let's like a, let's put Bangalore, why don't we go to Bangalore and um, actually tell the outsourcing story. So uh, we came to Bangalore with our crew in, in February uh, 2004, and um, uh, we did some amazing scenes. We went to the class where they told, taught people how to say Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, um, and uh, um, uh, in the old calls, really core call center stuff. And um, uh, the longer I was here, the sicker I got, because um, I started seeing things I just never had seen before. Uh, I discovered that my lost luggage was being traced on Delta Airlines from Bangalore. I discovered that my cartoons were being you know, drawn here. I discovered that my software was being written here. And um, Nandan was actually gone during the two weeks of the filming. And um, I'd written a book about globalization called Lexus Neolatry in 1999. And the longer I was here in 2004, the more I realized my book was completely out of date. I, 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 and, and that something really big had happened. Uh, and I, I didn't know what it was. And every day, I was just more and more blown away by what was happening. So Nandan came the last day of our filming. Uh, he came back from a trip, and, and uh, we met up in his office upstairs, and we were sitting on the couch there. And I had my laptop on my lap. And um, at one point, he's explaining to me what's going on. He said, Tom, I, I've got to tell you, the global economic playing field is being leveled. And you Americans are not ready. Oh, I wrote that down on my little laptop. The global economic playing field is being leveled, and you Americans are not ready. Well, um, we then went in and did the interview, and we got done, and my mind was like exploding, you know. And um, I got back in my Jeep uh, and went back from Electronic City to my, I was staying at the Leela. It was about an hour ride in end of Bangalore day traffic. <laughs> That's right, only an hour. And. Um, Along the way, I just kept rolling over in my head what Nandan had said, the global economic playing field is being leveled. And then I realized, you know, he really is saying the global economic playing field is being flattened. And then it just popped into my head that when Nandan Nilakani, one of India's premier engineer entrepreneurs, was telling me was that the world is flat. And so I wrote that down in my little notebook, the world is flat. I got back to the Leela. This is exactly what happened. I ran up to my room. I called my wife in Bethesda and said, honey, I'm going to write a book called The World is Flat. She now says she thought that was a great idea, OK? <laughs> uh, it's, <laughs> it's not exactly how I remember the conversation. <laughs> but I was so excited about the idea that night was Nandan's 50th birthday party. And his, uh, his wife was having a, a birthday party for him, Rohini, and they had a Simon and Garfunkel impersonation duo. I never forgot. And between the hotel and his house, I sketched out on the back of an envelope just sort of some really rough ideas of how the book would come together. And Nandan was so excited. In the middle of his birthday party, he insisted I give a talk to all the guests about this book I was going to write. <laughs> all of this happened in like, uh, it, was, it wasn't long, but I basically, you know, we got it. We started batting around these ideas. And anyways, that's, that's how it all started. Um, and uh, so I, I owe a, a huge debt to, to Nandan, uh, to Mr. Murti for this great company I, I've watched grow. And, and um, uh, it's just a, it's a treat to be back here. So. Um, let me just say a few things about uh, thank you for being late, and then uh, Nandan will have a discussion, which I really look forward to. So 
Um, uh, the first question I always get on this book is uh, where from comes the title? Thank you for being late. Uh, and it actually comes from meeting people for breakfast in Washington, D.C., where I live. And um, I like to uh, have business breakfast when I can. Um, don't like to waste breakfast when I'm downtown eating alone, so I often schedule business breakfast. And every once in a while, someone comes 10, 15 minutes late. And they'll say, Tom, I'm really sorry. It was the weather, the traffic, the subway, the dog ate my homework. And um, uh, one day, three and a half years ago, Peter Corsell, an energy entrepreneur, came 15 minutes late and said, Tom, I'm really sorry. It was the weather, the traffic, the subway, the dog ate my homework. And I just spontaneously said to him, actually, Peter, thank you for being late. Because you were late, I've been eavesdropping on their conversation. <laughs> Fascinating. I've been... People watching the lobby, fantastic. And best of all, I just connected two ideas I've been struggling with for a month. So thank you for being late. Um, so people, people started to get into it. They'd say, well, well, well you're welcome. Uh, because they understood I was actually giving them permission to pause, to slow down, to reflect. My favorite quote from the front of the book is from one of my teachers, Dove Seidman, who says, when you press the pause button on a computer, it stops. But when you press the pause button on a human being, it starts. That's when it starts to reflect, rethink, and reimagine. And boy, don't we need to be doing a lot of that right now. Now, the core argument of the book is that we are in the middle of three nonlinear accelerations all at the same time with the three largest forces on the planet, which I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. So Mother Nature for me is, um, is climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, and population growth in the developing world. If you put it on a graph, Mother Nature, it looks like a hockey stick, all three of those. It looks like Glacier National Park 1913, Glacier National Park 2012. Or it looks like Lake Chad, 1963, Lake Chad, 2001, it's much smaller now. Or it looks like global average temperature, looks like a hockey stick. Or it looks like the mother of all hockey sticks, uh, reported instances of extreme weather. Or it looks like the mother of the mother of all hockey sticks, world population growth. So if you put Mother Nature on a graph, she looks like that. The market for me is globalization, but not your grandfather's globalization. That was containers on ships and planes. That's actually flat to going down. What's actually taking the world from interconnected to interdependent is actually digital globalization. What you all are both drivers of and, and beneficiaries of. If you put digital globalization on a graph, it looks like that. Total data consumed per month, or it looks like that mobile cellular subscriptions in the US or India or just about anywhere else. It looks like another hockey stick. And lastly, Moore's Law, coined by Gordon Moore in 1965 in a famous article in Electronics Magazine, the co-founder of Intel, posited that the speed and power of microchips would double roughly every 24 months and the price would stay roughly the same. And Moore's Law has held up now for 52 years. Now, once a year for the last 52 years, someone has written an article saying, Moore's Law is over, Moore's Law is over running up against the limits, running up against the limits. And what all those authors have in common is they were all wrong. Um, Moore's Law is alive and well. This PowerPoint, I would guess, is running on a Intel 14 nanometer chip. It has 37.5 million transistors per square millimeter. Uh, under Moore's Law, at the end of this year, probably right now, Intel's begun shipping its 10 nanometer chip. Um, three years later, and it has 100 million transistors per square millimeter. So if you think the world is fast, wait till the end of the year. What's the difference between a 10 nanometer chip and a 14 nanometer chip? A 14 nanometer chip needed the whole trunk of a car, of a self-driving car, to contain the brains of that car. And a, in the world of 10 nanometer chips, you'll just need a little box under the front seat. And the folks at Intel can tell you exactly how they're going to make the seven nanometer chip. And behind that sits quantum computing. In fact, it's quite amazing. When I started this book, I was working a lot with IBM well, Watson, their team. 
And they gave me um, a side tour one day to this room where they were just kind of messing around with quantum computing. And uh, three weeks ago, I did an event with John Kelly, who runs uh, uh, the Watson Project for IBM. And he told me there is now a global race on quantum computing with Microsoft, Google, IBM, and several Chinese companies. And um, like in these four years, it's just accelerated phenomenally. Um, in fact, John Kelly has another of my favorite quotes in the book that because of that race, he said, you know when you buy a new car, I don't know if it's true in India, but in America, they usually come with a sticker on the rear view mirror. And the sticker says, objects in your rear view may be closer than they appear. John says that belongs on the front windshield of your car right now. It's the stuff coming at us that is much closer than it appears, <laughs> okay? Um, so my basic argument is that these three accelerations, they're not just changing your world, they're, they're reshaping your world. And they're reshaping five realms. They're reshaping politics, uh, geopolitics, ethics, uh, community, and the workplace. And um, uh, my book really is, is the first part is about how these accelerations work, where they came from, and the second part is about how they're reshaping the world. I'll just say one more thing, and then we'll go to the discussion uh, with Nandan. My, I can't obviously go through the different chapters, but my chapter on Moore's Law is called, What the Hell Happened in 2007? What the hell happened in 2007? Now I know what you're thinking, 2007 is such an innocuous year. What, 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 what's this guy talking about? So here's what happened in 2007. Uh, the year was kicked off at the Moscone Center in San Francisco when this guy named Steve Jobs unveiled, unveiled the first iPhone in January of 2007. Uh, beginning a process by which we are now about halfway done, putting one of those phones in the hands, or a facsimile, in the hands of just about everybody on the planet. And that phone is actually a handheld computer with more compute power in it than the Apollo space mission. And I hear that it doubles as a phone and a camera. That's how the year started. Uh, in 2007, a company called Facebook opened its platform with, to anyone with a registered email address. So it broke out of high schools and universities and went global because old farts like you could use it as well. And me. Uh, in 2007, a company called Twitter split off on its own platform and went global. In 2007, the most important software you may have never heard of called Hadoop, named after the founder's son's toy elephant, launched into the wild. Hadoop is what enables a million computers to work together as one. I think that's called big data. Hadoop didn't invent those algorithms, GFS and MapReduce. They were invented by Google. But as Doug Cutting, the founder of Hadoop, explains in the book, Google lives in the future and sends us letters back home. And what Google did was leave a trail of breadcrumbs for the open source community to reverse engineer its big data algorithms and create a free public version of it. Uh, and it is called Hadoop. In 2007, the second most important software you may have never heard of called VMware went public. VMware is what enables any operating system to work on any computer. When I was here in 2004, that was impossible. In 2007, the third most important software you may have never heard of called GitHub opened its doors. GitHub today is the largest repository of open source software with over 15 million users, I'm sure many on this campus. In 2007, this company called Google bought a little known TV company called YouTube. And in 2007, the same company called Google launched into the wild its own operating system. I hear it's called Android. Uh, in 2007, IBM launched the world's first cognitive computer. It's called Watson. In 2007, a guy up in Seattle named Jeff Bezos launched the world's first ebook reader called the Kindle. Uh, in 2007, three design students in San Francisco who were attending the design conference that year noticed all the hotel rooms were sold out. But one of them happened to have three spare air mattresses. And they thought it would be cool if they rented those out to people who could get hotel rooms, and it worked out so well. In 2007, they started a company called Airbnb. Here's what else happened in 2007. That's a graph of the cost of sequencing a human genome. You'll notice it's $100 million in 2001. 
It falls to $10 million in 2006, and then it goes over a cliff like an EKG heading for a heart attack in uh, 2007. Uh, that's a graph of solar power. It takes off in 2007, as did a process for extracting natural gas from tight shale called fracking. Between 2006 and 2008, America's total natural gas reserves increased by 35%. That is a staggering number in 18 months. Uh, this is a gra graph, basically, it's a depiction of social networks. So the white line going down, um, that's the cost of generating a megabit of data. And you notice the line goes straight down like another EKG heading for a heart attack in uh, 2007. Uh, the two line, the blue line is the speed of transmitting that data. The two lines cross in 2008. That's close enough for government work. Uh, oh, this is a graph of cloud computing. Let's see, when is the first year statistics show up? Looks like 2008, which would mean the cloud was born in roughly 2007. In 2007, Intel for the first time went off silicon to extend Moore's law. It introduced non-silicon materials into its microchips. In 2007, the internet, late 2006, crossed a billion users for the first time. Seems to have been a tipping point. In 2005, Michael Dell, the founder of Dell Computers, retired. And in 2007, he decided he had to come back to work. Nandan, what else happened in 2007? Uh, yeah, I think four other things. One is two young kids in Bangalore started a company called Flipkart, who were in mm -hmm. the 20s. Uh, then Google launched Street View, which allowed you to, uh, 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 you know, it's like take maps to a whole new level. Yes. And then uh, that was the year Netflix launched video streaming. So they went from sending DVDs in an envelope to video streaming, which is the today's Netflix. Yeah. And most important, the first cyber war in the world happened in 2007 because the Russians attacked Estonia using cyber warfare. I love it. I love it. Turns out, friends, 2007 may go down in time as one of the single greatest technological inflection points since Gutenberg. And we completely, we completely missed it. And you know why we missed it? Because of 2008. So right when our physical technologies just took off, like we were on a moving sidewalk in an airport that suddenly went from five to 50 miles an hour, right when that happened, all of our social technologies, the learning, adaptation, political reform, regulatory reform, you'd want to go with that, completely froze because we entered the deepest recession since 1929. And in that dislocation, a lot of Trump and Brexit voters were born. <laughs> because a lot of people got unmoored. Um, what actually happened in 2007? Well, I argue in the book, um, I, I think this laptop running this PowerPoint, this laptop, it actually has five key parts. Uh, it, it's got um, uh, the Moore's Law processor. Uh, it's got a, a, a storage chip. It's got networking. It's got software. And it's got a sensor. It's got a camera. Um, and what I do in the book is trace how all five were actually in their own Moore's Law. And I think in 2007, they all melded together into this thing we call the cloud, the cloud. But I never use the term the cloud in my book because it sounds so fluffy, so soft, so cuddly. It sounds like a Joni Mitchell song. I've looked at clouds from Bosun. This ain't no cloud, folks. This is what I call in the book a supernova. Uh, the science students among you will know the supernova is the largest force in nature. It's the explosion of a star. And that's because in 2007, I think we saw a release of energy into the hands of men, women, and machines, the likes of which we have never seen before. You know, someone was alive when Gutenberg invented the printing press. And you can bet when that happened, some monk said to some priest, now that's really cool. You know, I don't have to write all these Bibles out longhand anymore. We can just stamp them out, okay? Well, I think you're here for a similar inflection point. And in 2007, that release of energy created four new kinds of power. It changed the power of one. What one person can do today as a maker or a breaker is like anything we've ever seen before in history. We now have a president who can sit 
in his pajamas in the east wing of the White House and tweet directly to a billion people without an editor, a libel lawyer, or a filter. I'm not going there. I'm not going there. Um, but what's really scary is the head of ISIS can do the exact same thing from his bunker in Raqqa province in Syria. The power of one to be a maker or a breaker today has fundamentally changed. The power of machines have changed. Uh, we crossed that line, I'd say, on February 14, 2011, on, of all places, a game show. There were three contestants. Two were the all-time Jeopardy champions, and the third contestant simply went by his last name, Mr. Watson. Mr. Watson passed on the first question. He let the humans answer it. But he buzzed in before the two humans on the second question. See if you can get it. The question was, it's worn on the foot of a horse and used by a dealer in a casino. And in under 2.5 seconds, Mr. Watson said in perfect Jeopardy style, but artificial voice, what is a shoe? What is a shoe? And for the first time we saw live on television, a cognitive computer solve a pun riddle faster than two human beings. And the world kind of hasn't been the same since. It's changed the power of flows. Ideas now flow and circulate and change and congeal faster than we have ever seen before. Seven years ago, Barack Obama said marriage is between a man and a woman. Today, Barack Obama says marriage, blessedly so, is between any two human beings who love each other, and he followed Ireland in that position. We saw in our Virginia election, it's fascinating, a transgender woman defeated a right-wing, uh, I don't know how to describe him, who had run on homophobia and won for 20 years. And overnight, he's defeated, not by a gay, but by a transgender candidate. Amazing how quickly ideas now change and flow and congeal. Where did you want to build your town in the Middle Ages? You wanted to build your town on a river, because that river brought you ideas and it brought you food, and it brought you transport, and it brought you energy. You wanted to build your town on the Amazon. Where do you want to build your town today? On Amazon.com. You want to build it on the digital rivers, the digital flows, because they, because the stocks don't matter anymore. It's who's in touch with the flows that now will drive a company or a community. And lastly, it's changed the power of many. So we as makers and breakers, we are now having such a forcing function in and on nature that the new climate era is being named for us, the Anthropocene. So my argument is these four changes in power, they're not just changing your world, they're reshaping your world, the workplace, politics, geopolitics, ethics, and community. And that's what the second half of the book is about. And that's a good segue to bring Nandan up, and we will have our little chat. Thank you very much. As Nandan joins you, Thomas, you know, I'm thinking 10 years from now, we should be asking the question, what the hell happened in 2017? Well, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure we will. It's, okay. a, it's a very good point because, you know, basically all these are platforms. You know, I mean, mainframe was a platform, lap the desktop was a platform, the, the phone was, a, the, the uh, smartphone is a platform. And you know these platforms form, and then they scale, you know, and then they spawn new technologies, and you get to step up. And so, what happened in 2007, I think, Nandan, it was not a difference in kind, but it was a difference in degree. That some steps are bigger than others. Absolutely, Tom, that was great, and I think you always have a great way of putting Thank you. your story forward. So, uh, just wanted to know. I mean, you know, you you're thought about these mega trends like Mother Nature, markets, and uh, Moore's law. So when you write your columns and you're trying to explain something, you have a mental model of how it works, right? And could you give an example of, say, something you wrote about Niger or somewhere? Sure. And how a Trumpian view of the world. Yes. And how you look at it through a proper lens. So um, you know, one of the points uh, I was talking with um, uh, Nandan yesterday and, and um, with some of your team today is that uh, one of my teachers, Lynn Wells, always likes to say, um, never think in the box and never think out of the box. Today you must think 
without a box. And um, uh, I really, really believe that because when things are moving this fast, unless you think without a box, you'll never actually see what's going on. And so I recently, um, last year I did a documentary in, in Niger um, about human migration to Europe. And um, uh, you may have noticed, or we had this really sad news in America, we lost four soldiers in Niger. It was a shock to most Americans. We had no idea we even had troops and didn't know where Niger was, let alone that we had troops in Niger, let alone that a troop was killed in Niger. I mean, just it was just like total outer space, you know, um, move. It could have been from Pluto, you know. And um, uh, so I did a column in which I explained, um, and, and it, was a, it was a criticism of President Trump because his view is, well, you know, there are terrorists. Uh, they, by the way, all this happened near Lake Chad. Uh, which, by the way, is not an accident at all, which borders, um, uh, Niger borders. So um, the real story of, of, uh, of Niger is um, uh, basically, you know, there are terrorist groups forming there, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and, you know, Trump says there are terrorist groups, send troops there to kill them, and that's the end of the story. Um, the real story of Niger is that, um, and this is what our documentary was about, uh, we start actually in northern Senegal, because um, the whole Sahel region, sub-Sahara, is experiencing vast deforestation and massive climate change. So these villages in northern Senegal today have no men. Um, there's no men in any of them, basically between the ages of 18 and, and 60, virtually no men, because uh, they've all left because small-scale agriculture has collapsed and the population has exploded, and the combination of climate change and population growth has meant that these, these villages can no longer sustain their men. Um, so then they get on WhatsApp, and there are now recruiters all over the Sahel region, uh, human trafficking recruiters, and they all gather in Niger in a town called Agadez, which is in central Niger, a UN World Heritage Site. Um, uh, and, um, and every Monday night, a giant caravan forms there of 200 cars. These all were actually tourist vehicles that have been repurposed for human trafficking. And uh, each car has 20 to 25 men in the back, and they form a giant caravan of 200 cars that speeds across uh, the desert, tries to get them to Libya, drops them off there where they try to get into Europe. Uh, and it's a tragic story. But um, so what is our president doing? He's, he's sending troops to kill terrorists at the same time as he actually uh, eliminated all US financial support for global family planning at the same time as he appointed climate deniers to every single key environmental post in his administration. So um, that's called uh, thinking in a box. Um, uh, because you think that the answer to all of this is just send troops, when of course this is a climate issue, this is a population problem, it's a WhatsApp challenge, um, and uh, if you don't think without a box about that problem, you're going to end up getting one of your young men killed. Uh, can you talk about your last conversation with Trump? Um, so Donald uh, and I know each other a little bit and um, from the world of golf. Um, I've actually never played with him, but I've played on his courses. And uh, I was telling Nandan the other day that in uh, 2000, well, in Obama's last year in office, uh, he signed the deal with Iran, uh, the nuclear deal. And um, I was invited to um, come to the Oval Office the day the deal was signed to do an interview with the president about that deal. It was a historic moment. I was so excited. Unfortunately, I had just broken my shoulder two weeks earlier. And um, I was on OxyContin. I was on just all these opioids. I was in terrible pain. So I brought my daughter along. She carried my stuff. My, my colleagues tied my tie. You know, um, I sat down to interview the president. We, we did this actually on television. New York Times TV, and there were like three of them, you know, and they were, you know, I was really in a bad state. Um, anyways, I did the interview, and afterwards, I got asked by a lot of the morning shows what I'd be on, talk about, and I said, you guys, you know, I'm in such pain, I'll call you in two weeks. And two weeks went by, uh, and they invited me on, and um, in between, Trump had announced his candidacy, and that he was against Mexican rapists, he was going to build a wall, and all this stuff. So, um, uh, so now I go on these shows and not interested about talking about Iran at all. They just want to talk about Trump. What do you think about that? And I said, well, actually, I'm a kind of a hardliner on immigration. I'm for a very high wall with a very big gate. Okay, so I'm for a high wall with a big gate. Control the border so you reassure people, and then I'm a radical pro-immigration. 
Anyways, I got done. I went home, uh, popped a few more Oxycontin, and, um, uh, and my secretary called and said, uh, uh, Donald is looking for you, because he used to call every six months or so. And, um, so I said, put him through, and, and um, so he said, Tom, um, high wall, big gate. I love that. I'm going to steal it. Um, and I said, uh, I said, Donald, you can steal it if you give me credit one out of four times. And um, uh, uh, so we, we, we jabbered about that for a while. Um, and then he wanted to talk about John Kerry, what a bad job he was doing. And I said, yeah, I'm, I don't want to talk about Kerry now. I said, but, but Donald, um, Mrs. Friedman has a message for you. Because I told him, my, I told my wife I was going to talk to him. And he said, what's that? I said, Mrs. Friedman says, you have the country's attention. Use it for good purposes. Oh, Tom, good purposes, good purposes, absolutely. <laughs> so that night he went on the debate. It was one of the morning of the debate, or the morning before the morning of the debate, I don't remember anymore. And he said, I'm for a very high wall with a beautiful door. <laughs> OK, OK. So it wasn't, it wasn't exactly what I had in mind. Um, and I haven't talked to him since. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Now, I just want to just move quickly to the, the Middle East, because you've been, you were the New York Times correspondent in Beirut, and you know Arabic, and you wrote those great books from Beirut, Jerusalem, and the Olive Tree. And, uh, you've also been following the development in, in Saudi, where I know that uh, Crown Prince Mahmoud bin Salman looks at you as uh, someone who the West, uh, take a message to the West. So what is happening in, in, in Middle East, and specifically in Saudi Arabia right now? Well, it's a good question, I and mean, we're all, um, in some ways, trying to figure it out. You know, um, I've had a chance to interview uh, the, the Crown Prince twice now, and um, there's a few things I, I would say about him. The first thing I always say about him is that he's much more McKinsey than Wahhabi. You know, um, uh, so uh, uh, much more, you know, um, KPIs than Quran. You know, uh, so. Uh, uh, um, and, uh, and that's actually a very healthy thing, I think. Um, uh, because, um, you know, the Middle East that we're living with today was really shaped in 1979. Uh, because uh, three big things happened in 1979. It was also a vintage year. Uh, in 1979, the Iranian Revolution happened. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan happened. And the Mecca Mosque, uh, the Holy Mosque in Mecca, was uh, taken over by radical hyper-fundamentalists who said the Saudi ruling family was not religious enough. And that set Saudi Arabia on a right turn um, uh, where they became, they shut everything down at home and they began exporting um, uh, their very puritanical version of Islam uh, throughout the whole Muslim world, including to India. Um, uh, and the war in Pakistan fed that, and the competition with Iran, which had just had its Islamic revolution, fed that as well. And the result of that was that um, uh, Saudi Islam really spread from Morocco to, the, uh, to Indonesia in a way it really hadn't before, and it changed the face of Islam. Uh, if you look at the graduating class picture of Cairo University in 1960, uh, you'll see men and women together, and none of the women are veiled. If you look at the graduating class of Cairo University this year picture, almost all the women are veiled, and there are probably even fewer women. And that is courtesy of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I mean, that was really one of the effects they had on, on, uh, on the much softer face of Islam uh, that had prevailed in a lot of these countries. So I think one of the most important things he has dedicated himself to do and has actually taken steps to do uh, is really try to bring back a more moderate Islam that uh, took a detour in 1979, hugely important. Um, uh, the other thing I say about him is that if he didn't exist, the system would have had to invent him because someone had to do this job. That country was heading for a, a certain and slow death um, uh, because oil is not going back to $150 a barrel. Their population continues to soar. They've been sending 200,000 kids a year to Europe and America to get educated. 35,000 now come back every year, men and women, looking for good jobs. And um, the private sector there simply is not dynamic enough to handle them, uh, to, to, to sustain them and to satisfy them. So um, uh, I really think that he's uh, on the right track um, uh, in terms of um, really trying to radically reform the country. I think the big question is, is he too late? 
um, uh, is the system just too far gone, that it can't be reformed fast enough. Um, and, uh, you know, you, th this is a very inept and exact, inexact analogy, but, you know, um, you look at what's going on at GE today. I mean, like, wow, with GE, this was like a, we thought of just a pillar of American industry, and um, the stock is collapsing. I mean, their, their, their world seems to, you know, they seem to have missed every boat, and it happened so fast, you know, where, bam, uh, an icon like that. And so um, when the world is this fast, because these accelerations, you know, small errors in navigation can have huge consequences. It's like a 747 pilot who just enters two numbers of data wrong, you know, a two and a five, and he enters them as the five and the two, and suddenly finds himself 10,000 miles off course. And, um, and the cost of getting back on course becomes hugely painful. So therefore, leadership always mattered in a company, in a country. Today, it matters more. And do you have a leadership that's waking up every day saying, what world am I in? What are the biggest trends in this world? And how do I align my business, my country, with these trends to get the most out of them and to cushion the worst? And Saudi Arabia, you know, um, has had really three generations of, of, of lagging and flagging leadership, you know. And um, so he's got a huge challenge. And what worries me is that he's biting off too many things at once, trying to take on Iran here and Yemen, domestic reform, arresting billionaires, you know, you need allies when you do these things, and I do worry. Um, and I would watch that story. It's, I think, going to be one of the biggest dramas in the world.